It's my privilege tonight to briefly introduce to you Tom Wright. As most of you know, Tom is a prolific author, uh, writing by some counts more than 70 books. His work bridges both church and the academy. He is the author of books Simply Christian, Surprised by Hope, Jesus and the Victory of God, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, and his most recent volume, The Day the Revolution Began. Tom has taught extensively in academic settings, including McGill University and Oxford University, and his present position as research professor of New Testament and early Christianity at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Tom has also served the church in a variety of ways by extending his ministry through a vast public lecturing, speaking, and the recently developed online courses. Tom has contributed a tremendous amount of energy and devotion to Christ uh, in a variety of different venues. And my personal favorite venue is seeing a man of his talent actually balance spaghetti and meatballs on paper plates with graduate students at Gordon-Conwell Seminary in married student housing. And if you can write what he has written, speak what he has lectured and managed to do that as a tremendous set of skills. I wanted to share a very brief word of personal reflection on the occasion of Tom's visit. I've known him for more than 20 years. Uh, his influence has uh, touched many lives, including my own. And the occasion of his visit here to Cincinnati and to Kenwood uh, caused me to reflect on the things that I have learned personally from him and wanted to share these very briefly. I've learned from Tom that history matters. The Christian faith is rooted in events that actually took place. That theology matters. That the scripture is fundamentally a revelation of the person of God. That we can know truth with reasonable certainty and skepticism is unwarranted. I learned from Tom that Jesus achieved the victory of God upon the cross. I learned from Tom that the Apostle Paul never stopped thinking like a first century Jew. I learned from him that eschatology affects us every day and that the end times have begun in Christ, the new age of God's saving work and his new creation has dawned. I learned from him that scholarship of the highest order belongs in the church. I learned from him that academics need Christ as well. I learned from him that the church offers real hope to this world and this week on the other side of the empty tomb that the church has a mission in the world. And lastly, I learned from him over many years that Christian gentlemen always have time for others and that very busy people respond quickly to personal emails and letters, that they accept invitations to speak, whether at Google, a university campus, or a local church. I learned that they carefully prepare thoughtful words for all such times and that these words will shape all who attentively hear. So please join me in praying that the Lord would strengthen Tom this evening and speak to us. And would you join me in welcoming Tom Wright. Thank you so much for your welcome and for the wonderful hospitality I've been enjoying in the last, uh, however long it is, 24 plus hours. It's a long time since I've been in Ohio, let alone Cincinnati, and it's good to be back at last and to sense what's going on in this church and what's going on uh, through this church and others in this great city. But I have a huge task tonight, which is to try in the next hour and a bit, and I've been given slightly longer than one normally has, to sum up one of the greatest themes in the history of human thought, which is the meaning of the death of Jesus of Nazareth. As we in the church have often domesticated this theme, we've treated it as one topic among others in our lectures or our sermons, in our repertoire of Christian truth. But the New Testament itself insists that this theme of the death of Jesus is, is one where we glimpse, if we dare, the deepest and darkest truths about God, about the world, and about ourselves. And my prayer tonight has been for courage to keep our eyes open to see all this. And when I say courage to keep our eyes open, you need to know that on my body clock right now, it's about half past midnight. So um, uh, it may only, I'll say more about that in a minute. 
Um, but uh, as you know, I'm here summarizing this book, which David has mentioned, The Day the Revolution Began, which is also a topic of one of the courses at the online courses, again, which David mentioned, ntwriteonline.org, if you're interested in following up those. But the, the, the other challenge for me personally, obviously, in terms of jet lag and so on, here is the danger. In my Anglican tradition, we have a standard joke about the preacher who dreamed he was preaching a sermon and woke up to find it was true. And... Um, <laughs> I, I, I shall do my best to avoid that risk, though in a different sense I hope and pray that what I say is indeed true, true to the scriptures, true to the love of God revealed once for all in the crucifixion of Jesus. And to get us into this topic, three short questions with the preacher's usual trick of alliteration, fairly obviously, the power of the cross, the purpose of the cross, and the puzzle of the cross. This is the brief intro, not the real menu, but I may just help to get us in. So the power of the, what is it about the crucifixion of Jesus that seems to carry a compelling power even to many people who know almost nothing about its meaning? In the book, I told a story which is a well-known story, but I didn't know when I wrote the book who the original subject was, and somebody who, wrote, who read the book early on emailed me with a link to tell me who the subject was. So I found out it was a former Cardinal Archbishop of Paris, Jean-Marie Lustiger, who retired from that post in 2005. He once, as Archbishop of Paris, gave a homily including a story about a group of boys in Orléans, in France, in 1939. The boys wanted to have a bit of fun, and they dared each other to go into a church, Catholic church, of course, and confess a list, a terrible list of made-up sins to the priest in the confessional. Oh, Father, bless me, for I've sinned. I've done this and this and this and this. And a great long list of crazy things. And one of them, who was a Jewish boy named Aaron, took up the challenge, and he went into the confessional, and he confessed all kinds of wild and wacky things. The priest saw at once, as priests might, what was going on, and instructed him to do a penance. He said, I want you to walk up to the east end of the church, where there was a large statue of Jesus on a cross, a large crucifix. He said, I want you to look at Jesus and to say three times, Jesus, I know you died for me, but I don't give a damn. And the boy, who was still playing his own game, thought, well, this is a bit of a laugh too. So he went up and he said it once. Then he said it a second time. But he couldn't say it the third time. He broke down in tears and he left the church a changed person. And the cardinal giving this homily said, the reason I know that story is that I was that young man. Now, stories like this can be multiplied again and again in our culture, in wider culture. The cross says something before you even know any words to put to it. And they resonate deeply with me personally. I recall a moment in my own boyhood when, for reasons I don't remember, but I remember the occasion, I found myself weeping and weeping at the thought of Jesus loving me enough to die for me. I have no idea what sermon I had just heard or what hymn I had just sung, something got through at a very deep level. And there are countless people who have been drawn into the faith to their own sheer surprise and sometimes embarrassment by the story of the cross in art and music as well as in preaching and testimony. The cross carries power. Why? This leads us to the question, my second introductory question, of the purpose of the cross. If we ask the average Western Christian, why did Jesus die? The normal answer we'll get is that Jesus died because we're sinners and we need to go to heaven. And that theme is so pervasive in Western culture that we fail to realize that it is only part of the truth. And you know what happens if you take one part of the truth and pretend it's the whole truth? It becomes an untruth. It distorts the part and the whole. Now, don't misunderstand me. We are indeed sinners. We do indeed need to be part of God's new creation when it comes, promised in Scripture. But to the surprise of many people, this larger hope is subtly different from what many people 
in our Western traditions have believed. I'll explain this a bit later, but let me just state one key point. In the earliest statement, official statement of the Christian gospel, the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. The point is that the story the scriptures tell is much larger and richer than Western theology has normally imagined. We have routinely heard that statement as meaning, in effect, the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the story which we were going to tell anyway, the going to heaven story, with a few biblical references dropped in as proof texts. Again, that's better than nothing. I'm much rather people believe that than that they were secularists or atheists or whatever. But that should only be a way station towards the richer biblical vision which both Old and New Testaments offer us. A little sidebar, I've said about three times now something about Western theology. What I mean is this, the tradition in the Western churches from medieval Catholicism on through different types of Protestantism, that tradition approaches these matters quite differently from the way it's done in the Eastern Orthodox churches. I once I guess it's nearly 10 years ago now, at the Lambeth Conference, um, actually 2008, so nine years ago, um, I had for a few days to play host to the Orthodox Archbishop of, the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Jerusalem, who was visiting the conference and had studied in Durham, which was where I was then working. So he was put in my, which is rather fun. You know how you address an Orthodox Archbishop? You call him your beatitude. Oh, so have some more coffee, your beatitude. You know, it's just... It's not the sort of sentence which I grew up thinking about, really. Um, but knowing this distinction between Western and Eastern theology, I pressed him two or three times. I'd really like to know what you and your churches say by way of explanation of the cross. And he smiled and said, the cross is the prelude to the resurrection. Because for the Eastern Orthodox churches, the whole point is that Jesus is alive, he's raised from the dead, and God's new creation has begun. Now, I think there are serious weaknesses in not following what the scripture says about Jesus' death, but the Orthodox, seeing how much the West has obsessed about that and often got it muddled, has just backed right off. So that's what I mean by saying Western versus Eastern. So we have a question about the power of the cross, a question about the purpose of the cross, and together these generate the puzzle of the cross. This is the last bit of alliteration you'll be getting from me tonight. You'll be glad to know. But this, too, subdivides into three. First, the theories. If you've studied this in seminary or in some adult Sunday school or whatever, you probably know that there have been several theories as to how the cross works, to put it crudely. And these have regularly been played off against one another. In our day, people have argued about Jesus as substitute versus Jesus as representative. Which do you want? Or Jesus as moral example. Are these to be played off against one another? How does all that work? And they've also been pitted against the theory which is known as Christus Victor, the belief that on the cross Jesus won the ultimate victory. If you say that, does that leave you with any substitution, representation, or moral example? How does that all work? In fact, you find all these ideas and more in the very early church in the second and third centuries. But theologians and preachers alike have found it really difficult to hold them all together. Does that matter? At one level, no, but at another level, yes, because the Bible seems to say something which sounds like each of those, and if we're to be faithful in following it through, we need to explore. And so that's the first puzzle about the theories, and the second bit of the puzzle is that most Christian teachers, if asked to explain the meaning of the cross, go unhesitatingly for Paul or Hebrews and hardly mention the Gospels. Isn't that odd? But many writers on the Gospels today reverse that uh, by expounding the theology of the four evangelists with hardly a glance at what they're saying about the meaning of the cross. And so they look back, well, the, the Gospels just tell us about the history of how Jesus actually got put on the cross, and then you go to the epistles to find the meaning. It's not so. I'm going to address this tonight. But the third puzzle goes with all this. Many Christians instinctively, when asked about the cross, reach for the category of sacrifice. And they interpret the sacrifice in terms of Jesus being punished for sin. 
But in the Bible and the Jewish tradition, that is not how sacrifices work. The only animal that has sins laid on its head is, for that very reason, not sacrificed because it would be impure. It's the scapegoat, which is driven out into the desert. The sacrifices have a different purpose relating to the larger biblical picture, the picture which our traditions have all but forgotten. And this, too, is a theme to which I shall return. So, granted the power of the cross, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that its purpose is harder to discern than we have often imagined. And when people have wrestled with this, they run into the puzzles I've mentioned. So let's begin at the beginning and address all these with the question which gives my book its title about the revolution. In the New Testament, it's clear that by the evening of Good Friday, once Jesus had died, the world was a different place. A revolution had begun. That's what the New Testament says. What on earth does that mean? Of course, nobody realized it that night. Jesus' family and friends were in shock and fear, and his enemies were grimly delighted. Nobody was saying, well, that was all very unpleasant, but he's died for our sins, so all is well. Absolutely not. But with Jesus' resurrection, it became clear that, in fact, Good Friday itself was, had been, the day the revolution began. Something had happened which was more than the opening up of a new religious option, more indeed than even the making available of a way of salvation for sinners who might want to take it up. Something had happened which had changed the cosmos itself. That's what we're going to explore tonight. A royal revolution in which the followers of Jesus are committed to live and which they are committed to implement. So I'm asking you tonight to join me not simply in going back to the Bible and the Gospel. I'm suggesting that when we do so, we might see fresh perspectives on what it means to be, as I've called it in the book, Passover people, people of the royal revolution, as we face pressing issues of many kinds in our society and culture. But why Passover? This is where the story really starts. All four Gospels make clear this one vital point, that Jesus chose Passover as the moment to go to Jerusalem. For years, I just imagined Jesus doing things completely unreflectively. We get to Jerusalem, it happens to be Passover time, and he gets crucified. No, this is very definitely intentional. His disciples try to stop him. Don't go there. They were wanting to stone you. Do you want to go back? Jesus says, no, this is what we have to do. He didn't choose tabernacles or Hanukkah. He didn't choose the Day of Atonement. You might have thought that would be appropriate. He chose Passover because Passover is the exodus moment and Jesus' understanding of his own vocation was to accomplish once and for all the new exodus for which Israel had longed. So Passover imagery in the New Testament, and there's plenty of it, isn't just miscellaneous decoration around the edge of an atonement theory whose real focus is elsewhere. It is the flesh and blood reality. Now, within the Gospel's recounting of that ultimate Passover, one scene stands out with special poignancy and power. John's Gospel displays deft artistry and fathomless theology throughout, but especially in the foot-washing scene in John chapter 13, where in a few lines we glimpse a tableau which is both intimate and touching and scary and dangerous. Having begun his gospel, as John does, with the all-creative word becoming flesh and revealing God's glory, John begins the shorter second half of his gospel with an acted parable of the same thing. Jesus removes his outer garments and kneels down to wash the disciples' feet, thereby summing up all that is to come in this act of divine humility, of loving redemption, of cleansing for service. For John, as indeed throughout the New Testament, Jesus' vocation to rescue the world from its plight and in so doing to reveal the divine glory in action is focused and symbolized and encoded in an action simultaneously dramatic, fraught with cosmic significance, that's how John wants you to read it, but also gentle and tender with human emotion 
We were singing just now uh, a hymn based uh, loosely on bits of Isaiah 40, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and so on. But this is, this is what's going on here. If you want to understand the great mysteries of Christian theology, of Trinity and incarnation and atonement itself, you could do worse than spend time with this theme, scene where the cosmic majesty of God meets the tender intimacy of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And John 13 begins by saying, having loved his own who were in the world, Jesus loved them to the end, to the uttermost. Here we see what it means. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, a love at once powerful and humble, sovereign and sensitive. And as always, Jesus surprises his followers as he was about to do even more the next day. Peter characteristically raises an objection. You shouldn't be doing this. And Jesus waves it away. If I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me, which produces a typical Peter overreaction. Okay, okay, not just my feet, but my hands and my head. Calm down, says Jesus. You are already clean because I have washed you, and all you need now is the regular foot washing. This is already a wonderful image of the whole person washing of the gospel itself, needing only the regular smaller scale washing of dusty feet. But like everything else in John's gospel, it is deliberately leading the eye up to the great saving act to come in which the filth and mire of the centuries will be washed away in the torrent of water and blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingling down. Jesus then resumes his garments and explains the surface layer of meaning, as I have done this to you, you should do it for one another, which also points forward to the ministries of the gospel unleashed in John 20, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Atonement then, atonement now. And the theology of the cross is ultimately only complete when it issues in the foot washing, fruit bearing, and world transforming mission of Jesus' followers. It is a one-off. Something happened on Good Friday which changed the world, but part of the whole point is that people who find that they too are changed by it have to share then in the work of implementing what was done. But now, into this scene of prophetic action and symbolic power, John has woven the dark strand which explains why all this is necessary and how the great redemption is to be accomplished. And this is the heart of the fresh perspective which I'm exploring. John says the accuser, the Satan, hasatan in Hebrew, uh, the, the Satan, but the Satan means the accuser. That's what the word is, is doing. The accuser had already put it into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. The accuser, the Satan, is the dark subpersonal force that has dogged Jesus' footsteps throughout his mission. When I say that, I think those of you who know Tolkien's Lord of the Rings will think of the way in which Gollum is never far away while Frodo and his companions undertake their fateful journey. Indeed, I think Tolkien was tracking a biblical theme there in that strand of his narrative, including the final denouement. Anyway, Jesus knows, of course, that the Satan is going to do this. Jesus had already hinted that one of his own followers would act out the great accusation, the charge that would take him to his death. That's what the accuser does. He levels accusations which bring people down. You see, it isn't just when you say Satan entered Judas that Judas was submitting to one particular temptation. He was, but that's not the point. Rather, he is now doing the accuser's work. The hate and shame of all the world, the raging howl that rises from the accumulated forces of evil, of anti-creation, of tyranny and spite and sneering and lies, has gathered itself into one and has focused its deadly spotlight on the enfleshed word, the living embodiment of the loving and wise creator. And love only makes it worse because it is after the foot washing, where Jesus warns that you are already clean, though not all of you, after that, that the Satan enters into Judas. And Jesus says, do it quickly. 
and Judas goes out into the night. People sometimes say that St. Luke was an artist, but if ever a biblical scene had all the elements of a great canvas holding many different characters and moods within a single tableau, it is that foot washing scene in John 13. And I launch into that partly because I want to stir your imagination so that you move beyond theories and models and abstract schemes that can be played off against one another. And I want you to reach into the vivid historical reality, which, like many realities, needs art as well as science to grasp. John has positioned the foot washing story with deliberate care to launch the final moves that will take us to the foot of the cross and on beyond to the fresh morning in the garden and the warm breath of the outpoured spirit. We will come to the theories in a moment, but the theories mean what they mean as interpretations of the real life story, the real life narrative of the word made flesh, of the flesh made shameful, of the shame itself killed and buried. The theories about atonement are at their best battered little signposts pointing towards that larger reality. And the Gospels are written not to provide illustrations of the theories as though the theories were the real thing, but to name and invoke the historic realities towards which the theories point. Face it, when Jesus wanted to explain to his followers what his death was going to mean, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal on the one hand and a dramatic action on the other. The word became flesh, and it is in flesh, his flesh, and then worryingly our flesh, that the truth is revealed. God forgive us that we have often answered rationalistic skepticism with rationalistic fideism. The word, the logos, the ultimate reason in person became flesh. It's in flesh that the world was saved. It is in the flesh that the glory was and is revealed. When we pan back from John 13 and see this tableau within the larger context of the fourth gospel as a whole, we discover that the whole book is about the revelation of the divine glory precisely in the salvation of the world. And this means what it means within the vast and sprawling scriptural story of Israel and the world. One of the reasons we need fresh perspectives on the cross is that we have failed to pay attention to that great story. We've reduced it to a string of proof texts for doctrines which have been culled from elsewhere. John insists otherwise. And in particular, John's prologue, and take you on a journey back now, John's prologue urges us to see his whole story within the long reach of the first two books of the Bible, Genesis and Exodus. John focuses on the temple, on Jesus' upstaging of the temple, on his implicit warning to the temple and its guardians, and on his finally doing what the temple could not. What's that got to do with Genesis and Exodus? Time for some basic but often ignored biblical theology. Some of you know this stuff. Many of, many of you perhaps don't. Uh, I, like many New Testament scholars, was not working with this stuff at all until about 10 years ago when the present wave of temple theology in biblical studies really hit, landed on the beach where we New Testament scholars were forgetting about it. Genesis 1 and 2 describe to first century eyes the construction of the ultimate temple, the single heaven plus earth reality the one cosmos within which the twin realities of God's space and our space are held together in balanced mutual relation. The seven stages of creation are the seven stages of building a temple into which the builder will then come to take residence, to take his rest. Here is Zion, my resting place, says Israel's God, speaking of the temple in the Psalms. And within this temple, the final element created on the sixth day is the image. It's the last thing you put into a temple when you've made it. 
the image through which the rest of creation sees and worships the creator, the image through which the sovereign creator becomes present to, in, and with his creation, working out his purposes. Genesis 1 declares that the God who made the world is the heaven and earth God, the God we know as the one who determines to work through humans in the world. One of the most important things Genesis tells us about God is that he is the God who wants to work through humans to bring about his purposes in the world. Why did he want to do that? Well, many theologians have said, and I think they're right, because from the very beginning, what we now call, who we now call the second person of the Trinity was going to become the true human. That's a whole other story. But with this, we understand both the beginning and the climax of John's gospel. Think of the beginning. You know it well. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, etc., etc. In the beginning, en arche, bereshit in Hebrew. And the word then became flesh. Hold that in your mind and then move right the way to the climax in John 19. On the last Friday, the sixth day of the week, the world's ruler's representative, Pontius Pilate representing Caesar, declares, behold the man. Like Caiaphas earlier, Pontius Pilate says far more than he knows, acknowledging that Jesus is the proper man, the true image. When we gaze at him, we see the Father. And through him, the Father is present, working powerfully to bring about his desire and his design. And in the end, when the light has shone in the gathering darkness and the darkness has tried to extinguish it, the final word, John 19.30, echoes Genesis once more. It is finished. Tetelestai. It's accomplished. The work is done. Think again of Genesis 1 and 2. Sixth day creation of humans, completion of creation, the rest of the seventh day. And in John's gospel, the seventh day is the day when the word who had become flesh rests in the tomb before the eighth day. And John insists it's the first day of the new week. And Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb, finds it's empty, rushes to tell them, etc. Mary discovers that new creation has begun and quite rightly mistakes Jesus for the gardener. John is writing a new Genesis. And the death of Jesus places at the heart of this new heaven plus earth reality the sign and symbol of the image through which the world will see and recognize its creator and know him as the God of unstoppable love. The sign and symbol of the image through which the creator has established that love as the climax of history, the revolution that changes the world, the fountainhead for the rivers of living water that will now flow out to refresh and renew the whole world. That, the Genesis story, is the primary story that John is telling. But if it's a new Genesis, it's also a new Exodus. Here there's a problem. For years when reading Exodus, I used to misjudge what Moses said to Pharaoh. Remember, Moses says to Pharaoh, God says, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. And I used to think that was just an excuse. They, they, they wanted to go to the promised land, but they knew Pharaoh would let, never let them do that. So let's pretend that what we need to do is to do some worship out in the desert. But actually, the whole logic of Exodus and of the Pentateuch as a whole forbids that interpretation. Because if you read Exodus at a run, you'll arrive at Mount Sinai in chapter 20 quite easily. But then the pace seems to, you know, how it is when young people, I'm going to read the Bible through. They, Genesis is a great read. And the first 20 chapters of Exodus are amazing. And then suddenly we've got regulations about not seething a kid in its mother's milk and so on. And how many Bibles end up with the marker in Genesis 22 or 3 and never get any further? Um, <laughs> But in fact, if you just get over what seems to us, not to them, like a little blip, the narrative moves swiftly towards its intended climax, which is the restoration of creation itself, 
This is the purpose for which God called Abraham's family in the first place. The purpose that they would be a people in whom God's presence would come to dwell and take its rest once more. They would be the temple people, the tabernacle people, the family in whose midst heaven and earth would come together. Dangerously, of course, but also with the delight that we see in the Psalms. The giving of Torah itself in chapter 20 is just preparation. This is how to be the people in whose midst God will then dwell. What matters is the tabernacle. And we should thank God for the many studies of temple theology now available. And we should repent for the way we Protestants have ignored that whole dimension. The tabernacle is the microcosmos, the little world, the heaven and earth place, the mysterious, untamable, moving tent in which the living God has promised to dwell, to tabernacle indeed in the midst of his people as the pillar of cloud and fire. The whole book of Exodus is moving towards this moment in chapter 40. The tent is constructed and decorated with the highest human artistry, which is itself part of the point. And the divine glory comes to dwell in it so that even Moses couldn't enter because of that glorious presence. So Exodus 40 answers Genesis 1 and 2. Creation is renewed. Heaven and earth are held together again. The world is halted from its slide back to chaos. And the people of God, tent makers and tent keepers and pilgrims, wherever the glory-filled tent will lead them, are to live the dangerous and challenging life of a people in whose midst there now dwells in strange, humble sovereignty, the living hope for the whole of creation. This is, of course, why Leviticus is where it is and what it is, with the priests as the humans who stand at the intersection of heaven and earth. And this is why the Israelite sacrifices, as I said before, are distinguished from the pagan sacrifices which are trying to placate an angry deity. They are not like that. They are the means by which the cleansing blood, the carrier and symbol of life, will be used to purify the people and the sanctuary so that despite the sin and death which so easily cling to them, the living God can and will continue to dwell in their midst. The sacrifices maintain the heaven and earth reality in order that the tabernacle may be what it's meant to be, the advance signpost to the ultimate intention that God will flood heaven and earth with his presence at last. Now, all of this and much, much more, think of Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 8, for instance. Think of the vision in Isaiah 6. All of this is then poured by John into the dense revolutionary reality of the prologue as it reaches its climax. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Kai eskenosen and Hamin pitched his tent in our midst. John has exactly that Exodus motif in mind. And, says John, we gazed upon his glory. We have been allowed where Moses was not. We have seen the glory, the heaven and earth reality, the human microcosmos the tent where the God of the Exodus is revealed as the one God of creation and new creation. John is now describing the ultimate Exodus through which creation itself is rescued and renewed to be the new creation which comes to birth on the eighth day after the dark power, the great and terrible Pharaoh has been defeated once and for all. Now, of course, it isn't just Genesis and Exodus. Indeed, Genesis and Exodus themselves indicate that things are not going to be straightforward, to put it mildly. Genesis 1 and 2 give way to the whispering serpent, the original exile, the first murder, the long decline to human arrogance, which ends with the Tower of Babel, Eden and Babylon, like Jesus and Judas at the supper frame the action which follows as Abraham and his family are called to a stupendous vocation and repeatedly come within a whisker of throwing it all away. Go down to Egypt and, oh, she's my sister, etc., etc. Abraham is so faithful at one minute and so foolish the next. And then uh, when, when the children of Israel have been gloriously rescued, 
and they're on their way to their promised inheritance, just when Moses is being given instructions for building this extraordinary working model of creation called the tabernacle, what are they doing? They're down below the mountain making the golden calf so that Moses then has to engage in frantic verbal fisticuffs with God to preventing and aborting the, you know, God says, okay, this is it. You take your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt and you go and, and Moses says, no, 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 they're your people and you brought them out of the land of Egypt. It's your reputation that's, I love Jewish prayer. You know, it's really it's in your face. And, and he wins. You know, God says, okay, okay. Um, and as the Pentateuch moves to its dark and puzzling conclusion, it becomes clear that the people of God, the tent keepers, if you like, are still themselves a rebellious people who will have to suffer the fate of all those who put other images at the intersection of heaven and earth. They, like their primal forebears, will go into exile, not despite the fact that they're the covenant people, but precisely because of that dangerous vocation. God will fill his creation with glory, but it will come through the casting away and receiving back of his tent keepers and ultimately through the casting away and receiving back of their royal representative, their king, their Messiah. So Genesis and Exodus, you see what I'm doing? When Paul says the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, I'm saying, well, how does the scriptural story work? What is this thing in accordance with which the death of Jesus is to be understood? And it's to our shame in much Christian theology that we just haven't done this back, back story, this homework. So Genesis and Exodus give us the structure and the framework of all subsequent biblical theology, perhaps of John in particular. God will rescue and renew his heaven plus earth creation. And the tabernacle is the sign and seal of that promise. And Aaron and his sons are the image reflectors who hold that hope together. Israel is the royal priesthood for the whole of creation. That's how it works. The five books give us the story, stretching forward in the final chapters of Deuteronomy to embrace the whole period of kings and prophets, of exile and restoration. Of course, the kings themselves are a desperately ambiguous lot. But they're nevertheless called in the Psalms to be image bearers, to be the spearhead, the image is not too sharp, of Yahweh's victory over the powers of evil, to be the focus of his reign of justice and peace. In other words, there is to be a royal revolution against the dark powers that lord it in the earth. But of course, the kings and the priests fail miserably. The prophets see the glory of God and the shame of Israel side by side, and the glory departs and they go into exile. But Ezekiel then describes the new temple with Ezekiel 43 corresponding to Exodus 40 as the divine glory returns at last. And Isaiah in his gospel of comfort describes the scene of majesty in which the sovereign God comes back. Isaiah 40, the mountains are flattened, the valleys are filled in for the glory of God to be revealed for all flesh to witness it. You know, I, I, as a boy, I used to sing in a church choir and I'd sung Handel's Messiah three or four times before my voice even broke. And then as a young man, as an adult, I've sung Handel's Messiah. And I must have sung, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Literally dozens of times before it ever occurred to me to ask, what's this supposed to look like? What are we thinking of here? When does this happen? And in Isaiah, it's clear this is the exile will be, will be undone at last, but he will come back and you will see and you will rejoice. What will it look like? The pillar of cloud and fire? Will it look like Ezekiel's whirling wheels? The whole New Testament is written to say what it'll look like will be a young Jewish prophet announcing the kingdom of God and going to his death on a cross. That's what it looks like when the living God comes back in his glory. That's what John is telling us. This is going to be a new exodus. And as I said before, like Isaiah 40, the glorious majesty, immediately he will feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs in his arms and gently lead the mother sheep. It's exactly the picture we have in John 13. So this is a new exodus rooted in a new Passover. And this prophetic theme from Isaiah and Ezekiel and much besides, stretches like a long question mark over the 400 years after exile in Babylon. 
until a voice in the wilderness declares that the time has come. King, temple, new exodus, new creation. John sees these themes rushing to, this is why the gospels are so difficult but so exciting to read. All these different themes coming together and Jesus chose Passover as the moment for climactic action. The moment to awaken those biblical resonances which would frame his final kingdom bringing action and passion, his royal revolution. At the moment when all the people of Israel who told this story since they were small, every Passover they told the story so that they would pick up the resonances, they would understand the symbolism, they would know what it means. And the gospel writers tell the story of Jesus as the story of the strange new exodus in which the glory returns at last in a form nobody had seen coming. No wonder Caiaphas and his cronies were alarmed. Their priestly role, they thought they were the ones standing between heaven and earth. They were about to be upstaged once and for all by the true image, the word made flesh who would sum up in himself both the long-delayed obedience of Israel and the long-awaited return of Israel's God. We talk in theology about humanity and divinity of Christ. Much better to put flesh on those bones and to talk about Israel in person and Israel's God in person. When Paul quotes the early formulas there, then says that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, it is this complex narrative, full of doom and glory, that he has in mind. Proof texts are for the birds, or more accurately, for the neo-Marcionite rationalists. What matters, uh, let the reader understand, what matters is the story, the true story. Now, both John and Paul draw out one theme in particular from Exodus, from Isaiah, from the entire narrative. If Abraham's people are to inherit the world, Babel must be overthrown. It's how Genesis 11 and 12 work. It's how Isaiah works. Pharaoh must be overthrown if Abraham's family are to be rescued. Babylon and its gods must be overthrown if the new Exodus is to be accomplished. All this the prophets see, particularly again for Isaiah for whom God's kingdom will be established through the defeat of the dark power and the redemptive return of Yahweh to Zion. And for Isaiah, all that will be accomplished through the work of the suffering servant. All this is retrieved by the gospel writers, particularly John, as he leads the eye up from his prologue to the foot washing scene and onto the cross. Jesus signs in John, unveil his glory. Starting with the wedding at Cana, which is itself a temple image symbolizing the marriage of heaven and earth. I can't resist telling you, partly to lighten the load in the middle of a long lecture. A few years ago, one of my closest friends who had managed, bless him, to resist matrimony for a, a long time, despite the best efforts of some people to marry, have him married, he's a delightful guy. Finally, at the age of 50, he met the girl of his dreams and decided, and he asked me to take the wedding and preach. And he asked me if I would preach on John 2. And as I studied the text yet again and looked, I suddenly realized, here's a man who for 50 years had been saying, woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. <laughs> and, and the whole service went like a rocket after that. It was great. <laughs> So the wedding at Cana in John 2, as I say, is a temple image because it's about the marriage of heaven and earth. And the sequence of signs leads to the cross itself where the dark glory of God is revealed as the glory of the true image, the priest, the lover, the king, the royal revolutionary. This is why Jesus chose Passover. And this is why the gospels, particularly John's gospel, tell the story of Jesus as the new Genesis and the new exodus. So the theme of the new exodus, which is picked up in that foot washing scene where Judas embodies the Satan, it's highlighted in the previous chapter, John 12, where the focus is on the dark power now being defeated, the power, the ultimate Pharaoh that has held the world captive. 
In John 12, John quotes just those passages from Isaiah in which the themes I've sketched come to sharp expression. The crucial passage begins with a typical Johannine puzzle. Look at it sometime. You probably haven't got a Bible in front of you now. You may know it by heart. John 12, 20 to 36. Some Greeks come to the feast and they see Andrew and they, um, and, and they say, we want to see Jesus. Now, you might think, well, Jesus is open, easy access, he's not hiding. You might think he'll say, okay, let's meet in the marketplace tomorrow and we'll go and have a coffee or something and talk about it. But no, instead of arranging a time to meet, Jesus talks in riddles. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, for a grain of wheat to fall into the earth and die in order to bear much fruit. What's that got to do with these poor Greeks who simply want to see him? Jesus seems to be gazing beyond the immediate request to the ultimate purpose. The world upon which Jesus looks out, the pagan world and also now tragically the Jewish world, is in the grip of the Pharaoh, the dark Babel gods, the ruler of this world. So there's no point just having a chat with these Greeks here and now. What matters is not to understand the world, but to rescue it. This is the time for God's name to be glorified, for judgment to be passed. So Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world is to be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Do you see the point? Jesus' death will be the means by which the power that has gripped the world of Greek and Jew alike will be overthrown by the greater power, the power the world never imagined, the revolutionary power of a royal love which loves its own and loves them to the end. You see, in John's Gospel, there are two things which cannot happen until Jesus has died apart from the launch of new creation in the resurrection itself. First, interestingly, in chapter 7, the Spirit is promised to be poured out into and through the hearts of Jesus' followers, but that can't happen until Jesus is glorified. That's interesting in itself. But here in chapter 12, the dark power which has held the world in its grip must be defeated before it makes any sense for the Greeks to come to see Jesus. Look wider and weep for what the church has done. The Greeks cannot hold him within their world of theory. They need to be embraced by the world of the new temple, the new cosmos, which is going to open up when their present captivity is undone. We have taken this reality and turned it back into theory. No, Jesus' death will overthrow the power, the ruler of this world, and then it will be time, then it will be time, for the hidden wisdom to shine forth. This same logic, by the way, underlies all Paul's ideas about Gentile mission. The power that kept the Gentiles captive has been beaten, therefore it's time for them to come in. And this is why John chapters 18 and 19, where Jesus engages in sharp dialogue with Pontius Pilate, the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Caesar. This is why those chapters are so vital to the meaning of the story. And also, by the way, for the implications of the royal revolution in our own day. I think John 18 and 19 are the foundation of a Christian political theology. Though it's remarkable how many people try to write about God and politics and all that without ever noticing how those chapters work. How, how, what's going on there? Pilate asks about kingdom and Jesus replies about truth. Are you a king then? Jesus says, well, I came to bear witness. to What's that got truth? What's that got to do with kingdom? Pilate doesn't know what truth is because the only truth he knows is the truth he makes himself, the power, in his case, to kill. And Jesus says, actually, all power comes from above. And what he doesn't explain, because like the Greeks, Pilate just wouldn't get it, is that the ultimate power, the revolutionary power, is the foot-washing power, the power of radical, transformative love. How does this work? What sense does it make to think of the brutal killing of a young Jewish prophet as the ultimate act of love? 
This is where the theologians of the last few hundred years have answered with theories. None the worse for that, we need to have the structures to think, but the result is that we've all missed, except for homiletic application, what the gospel writers were really doing at this point. They explain the how of the cross, not with theory, but with real life stories. There is in John the tender moment with Mary and John. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. This is what the cross means. New relationships, new healing, new possibilities. There is Pilate himself declaring, what I have written, I have written. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. This is the launch of the kingdom of God. Pilate is acknowledging Jesus as lord of the world, the ultimate ruler, the ultimate justice bringer. Revolutionary though he be, Pilate, of course, only wants to show his scorn for the Jewish people. John sees that here, again, Pilate says more than he knows. And then there is the last word itself, tetelestai. It's done. It's accomplished. The new tabernacle, the new creation, rescued from the wreck of the old through the king who is also the Passover lamb whose bones remain unbroken. John's atonement theology comes at us rich and fast in incident after incident. And all of these and more insist that what really matters is the reality of people's lives, of the world's life, of the actual reality of God's created order. The Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, in particular with the great biblical and historical themes of new exodus, return from exile, the return of Yahweh to Zion, the enthronement of the true king, the completion of the priestly work to join heaven and earth together together once for all the social and cultural and political revolution launched upon the world creation itself ransomed healed restored forgiven these are the great biblical themes that come rushing together in the gospel accounts of Jesus death yes Paul matters Hebrews matters first Peter and Revelation matter but the four gospels give you the full multidimensional meaning of Jesus' death. My friends, please don't ever think of trying to construct something called an atonement theology unless you know with John and Paul what it means that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Because, of course, the Western tradition has tried to do it in so many other ways. We have erected different structures with Israel's scriptures merely as a ragbag source book for random prophecies to be fitted into the redemption narratives that we've gleaned from elsewhere. And we've then distorted those texts themselves to play the role demanded by these other narratives, narratives of divine honor offended, of divine law court sitting in judgment, of human muddle and mistake, of the longing for a disembodied heaven and the problem of embodied humanness which appears to stand in the way. These, even the last, are distant and at best distorted pointers to the reality. And if we start with them, we will skew the whole. Atonement itself, the word is far less precise than we often imagine, must include so much more, including, yes, notions of sacrifice. All these ideas themselves can be and have been distorted as we've put them into our different frameworks. And these and other mis misreadings are now enshrined in our traditions. The much cherished and heavily guarded statements of atonement theology that we all learned from the 16th century reformers, vital in some ways as they were as a bulwark against other errors, they were themselves framed far more in terms of late medieval ideas, particularly of purgatory in the mass, against which the reformers were reacting. The reformers were trying to give biblical answers to medieval questions. That's a noble aim, but the Bible itself sees that that's not enough. We must get inside the world of the Bible in ways that they never did. We must understand what it means that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the single complex narrative of Israel's scriptures. So what's gone wrong? Again, I've got three points to sum it up <clears throat> briefly. Three mistakes. And forgive the technical language, but I hope you'll see what I mean. First, we have Platonized our eschatology, 
I know it's half past eight at night. It's nothing compared with how late it is for me, but please hang on to this. We have platonized our eschatology. That is, we have assumed that the aim of the game is to go to heaven when we die, not realizing that the people who taught that in the first century were not the Christians, but the middle Platonists, not Paul, but Plutarch. The New Testament is not about souls going up to heaven, but about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth, about the new creation already symbolized in the wilderness tabernacle and brought into reality by the royal priest himself, Israel's ultimate re representative, the word made flesh. This isn't just a matter of adjusting some little nuts and bolts of what we think about the ultimate, about God's ultimate future. Because what we say about the ultimate future plays back at every point into what we say and think and pray and sing about the present. No, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were to become the tabernacle people. Because of that divine presence, they would inherit the promised land. And the promised land is seen in the New Testament, not as an image of heaven, but as an image of the whole creation to be flooded with God's presence and love. The whole world is now God's holy land. So that's the first mistake, to substitute going to heaven for the promise of new humanity and a new creation. But second, if we think simply about souls going to heaven, then we shrink the human vocation, which is to be image bearers, the royal priesthood, into mere morality. Morality matters, but it matters as the byproduct of being image bearers, summing up the praises of creation rather than worshipping and serving idols. Morality matters because only through properly functioning image bearers will God's rescuing justice flow out into the world. But if we focus on morality, copying Adam and Eve in putting knowledge of good and evil at the center of everything, then we turn the whole large drama of creation and new creation into a self-centered play about me and my sin and what God's going to do about it, rather than about God and God's creation and the vocation of human beings within that creation. And then we read Genesis, not as the story of the temple and the image, and not as the story of the cultural mandate to humans and the tragic, uh, tragedy of idolatry, but simply as the story of humans failing a moral exam deserving punishment and the punishment going elsewhere. But no, in the Bible, what matters ultimately is not sin but idolatry, wrongly directed worship. Idolatry produces sin. When sin happens, it's because idols are being worshipped. That's why the Christus Victor theme, victory over the dark powers, takes priority in Scripture over and then contextualizes the more focused matter of dealing with sin. The powers have to be defeated, and the way they're defeated is through that dealing with sin. Because when we worship idols, we give them power over us, whatever it may be. The power which we as image bearers ought to be exercising. And so we have platonized our eschatology, and to fit with that, we have moralized our anthropology. We've forgotten the new creation on the one hand and the real human vocation on the other. So if we've done that, the result is we have paganized our soteriology. If you go to the ancient world looking for stories of an angry God who wants to lash out at people and somebody else gets in the way, so now it's all right, isn't it? You won't find that in the Old Testament. You'll find it right across Greek and Roman literature. Now, of course, very few preachers or theologians will own up to preaching the gospel of Jesus like that. They will always insist that they speak of Jesus' death as the act of divine love. But you know and I know that this pagan story is what generations of people in the churches have heard. I was doing a lecture on this subject just a week or two ago in St. Andrews, and I was wondering how I could bring this home to my audience. And that morning, I had an email from a stranger who had read the book and who told me that his young son had just come back from Sunday school saying, apparently God wanted to kill us all, but Jesus stood in the way and showed God his scars and told God to back off. Now, I suppose, again, I'd rather somebody started there than never starting. But there are huge dangers in going down that route, starting with the fact that if we try to construct our theology like that, we'll never understand the Bible. But this mistake is all the easier to make 
because this is often how Christians have behaved, using would-be redemptive violence, whether domestically or internationally, and always asserting that it is done with the best of intentions, out of love. And so people hear what they think is the Christian message, but instead of hearing God so loved the world that he gave his only son, they hear God so hated the world that he killed his only son. And the biblical truth of penal substitution is thereby both distorted and shrunk. And many, particularly many young people, recognize only too clearly this isn't a God they want to know. And so they reject what they think must be the Christian message. This is a distortion of the biblical truth of penal substitution. There is a biblical truth we can call penal substitution, but it does not fit well with the Platonized eschatology and the moralized anthropology. It is sketched vividly in Luke. If you read Luke's, people used to say, astonishingly, that Luke has no theology of the cross. That's absolute rubbish. Look what happens in Luke. Again and again, Jesus is declared to be innocent, but he dies the death of the guilty. How much clearer can you get? Barabbas, the brigand on the cross. But Luke weaves the theme into the rest of his narrative as well. The Gospels give us substitution acted out, not simply in theory, but the theory comes as well. Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those in the Messiah because God condemned sin in the flesh. Note, Paul doesn't say God punished Jesus, he says God punished sin, which had accumulated itself in Israel's representative, the Messiah. It's obviously penal, obviously substitutionary, but it is not driving a theology of how we get to go to heaven. It's at the heart of Paul's story of how humans are rehumanized to play their appointed role within the renewal of creation by the Spirit. The four Gospels then are all about the kingdom of God, a theme often still muted to this day in much modern preaching and teaching. And the kingdom of God is accomplished, according to the Gospels, through the death of Israel's Messiah. Maybe part of our problem is that all this generates, as John obviously does, what we today with our little categories call political theology. How can the good news that the world's creator has rescued creation from disaster and has established his son, his true image, at the center of his... How can this news not at once have implications for every community, every polis, the Greek word city, every community and country, every polity and every policy? How can we not at once be driven to reflect and act on the basis that the dark powers that have been, have been defeated so that the power of love may flood the world and bring about the justice and peace which the secular world knows it wants but can't seem to find. And if we really grasp that as Passover people, might we not have at last a platform from which we could recognize and wisely critique those muddled posturings of politicians in the older Christian countries like Russia or Germany or Britain, as well as the newer ones like America, who have imbibed the Enlightenment's worldview in which religion and politics are two totally separate things. Might we not then begin to grasp a more complex and again dangerous, but also richly rewarding framework of thought in which the followers of Jesus are called to implement the victory which was won on the cross. Because you see, this is how it happens. We've not only distorted, but we've shrunk the biblical notion of substitution. One angry online review of my book accused me of failing to explain how the atonement then worked. This ignores the point. Here's how it works. In the four gospels, the story of Jesus is set in counterpoint with the biblical story of evil. It isn't just Israel's story that rushes together in the gospels, it's the story of cosmic evil. The snake in the garden, the towering, tottering, tottering tower of Babel, the power of Pharaoh killing the babies, think of Herod in the gospels, rebellious Israel, all the rest of it. That's all in the background, but then Jesus arrives announcing that God is becoming king and that it looks like this. What happens? He seems to draw upon himself as though by a magnet all the evil in the world from the shrieking demons in the synagogue to the plotting priests in the Sanhedrin and ultimately to Pilate, the pathetic representative of the world's ruler. 
and Judas and Pilate merely bring into sharp focus what is going on all along. Evil, sin with a capital S, is gathered into one place and does its worst. The worst thing imaginable, killing the one true man, the one genuine Israelite, the word made flesh. This is how atonement works. And with his death, exactly as in the prophets and Psalms, Pharaoh is overthrown, Babel crashes to the ground, the gods of this world are robbed of their power. As Paul says in Colossians, Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, celebrating his triumph over them. And this happened because Jesus, representing Israel, representing thereby the whole human race, and equally representing and embodying the one God himself, took upon himself the weight of evil hanging over all flesh. Caiaphas said, oh, it's better that one person die rather than have the whole nation perish, said more than he knew. This is your hour, said Jesus, as they came to arrest him, and the power of darkness. He knew what was going. He went into the heart of that darkness so that Peter and the others would not suffer it, so that Barabbas and the brigand on the cross might be freed, so that like the chickens protected by the death of the mother hen, those who came to him for refuge would find that he had taken their place. The victory is won. Christus victor, if you like, but a much bigger idea than many theories that have gone by that name. And it's won through the representative substitution of the servant, the son, the image, the lover, the foot washer, the one who has saved the world and revealed the glory at last. Jesus wins the revolutionary victory, which in the Psalms and the prophets is to be won by Israel's God himself. The role of the warrior Messiah, the royal revolutionary, turns out to be a role designed by the one God for his own personal use. And that, not some cheap and cheerful scheme, is why there is forgiveness. That is why the Gentiles are now freed from enslaving powers to enter God's family. That's why Jesus' followers do not constitute a religion like other so-called religions to be catalogued by secular modernity, pinned to the wall like so many dead butterflies but a polis, a new kind of city, a new kind of community, a spirit-driven, suffering love people who follow their master to the places where the world is in pain in order that by the spirit they may embody the foot-washing love of God and the pain of God right there and so bring God's healing and hope to the places which so badly need it. And that's why the church needs to reclaim our primary role of speaking truth, gospel truth. To, who do we have to reclaim it from? The media. They think it's their job. It's actually ours. Unless we read the gospels like this and to this end, we are falsifying them, as we do when we cut them up into little snippets and turn them into pretty little moral lessons, or even, heaven help us, into abstract theological lessons. The Gospels are the living story of how the Lord of life drew the powers of evil onto himself, and by dying under their weight, disarmed and disabled them, so that from now on they are a defeated rabble, even though in our dualistic modern spiritualities we still imagine them to have power over us. The Gospels are the launching narrative of our story, the first act in the new divine drama in which we are called to play our parts. And that is why, as I draw to my close, and thank you for your patient attention, I'm keeping the time that I was asked to keep, we need not a refined set of theories, but a larger vision of the biblical narrative if we are to understand and preach and live out the message of the cross. My book poses this question, by the evening of Good Friday, what had changed? Clearly all the New Testament writers think something has changed. What was it and how do we make that new reality our, our, our own? Now notice, the modern world has displaced that narrative because it says that the world reached its transforming climactic revolutionary moment in the second half of the 18th century. That's what we were all brought up to believe. So it isn't just that most of our contemporaries don't actually believe in God or Jesus, but they have in their heads a world narrative 
in which history arrived at its redemptive moment a couple of hundred years ago with the rise of science and technology, with the French and American revolutions, with the banishing of God to a distant realm. Thomas Jefferson said he was an Epicurean. That's what you do. You, God belongs way upstairs. To be visited by the pious few like a kind family calling on an elderly relative every Sunday. The Western churches have regularly colluded with this absurd diminishment of the Bible and the gospel. That's one of the reasons why in Yeats's words, the vacuum is filled by the rough beasts who are slouching towards Bethlehem. But the cross, told as the climax of all four Gospels, and particularly John's, leaves us no choice. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. We've got some fresh thinking to do, to put it mildly. But thinking, the realm of Logos, has become flesh. And it must become flesh again. Our flesh, our foot-washing flesh, driven by the Spirit to be for the world what Jesus was for Israel, to be the means, John 16, by which the Spirit holds the world to account. Having loved his own, having revealed the glory, Jesus loved them to the end. And as he got up, he said, this is my command that you love one another as I've loved. That's how the glory will be revealed in tomorrow's world. That's how the world, saved once and for all by his revolutionary victory on the cross, will be flooded with glory and love as the waters cover the sea. We are to be, in the power of the Spirit, new Genesis people, new Exodus people, new Isaiah people, new gospel people, new cross and resurrection people, new Jesus people. This is the royal revolution. And this is how I believe we must reconsider the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion as the vital truth we need to grasp in these turbulent and challenging times. Thank you. God bless you.